number 96 in our list um, is The Birds' uh, fourth album, Younger Than Yesterday. Uh, it was released by Columbia Records on February 6th, 1967. Seeing a lot of Columbia Records uh, albums so far, I'm, I'm thinking that they were pretty big um, in the 60s. i just taken a guess slightly. here. Um, just slightly. Yeah. Um, uh, it ranks 20th, um, in, in the year of 1968 and, uh, or sorry, 1967 and 927 of all time. Um, the original name of the band was actually Jet Set. Um, it was formed in 1964 by, uh, the guitarist, vocalist, three guitarists and vocalist, uh, Roger McGuinn, who actually at the time was, his, his real name is Jim McGuinn. Um, David Crosby, a guy you might. You might have heard about. We're going to probably be talking a lot about him um, in, in, in the coming weeks. Um, and Gene Clark, um, who all had backgrounds and interests in folk music. And um, later that year, um, in 1964, they, uh, they hired a, what, what apparently was a smoking hot drummer named Michael Clark. And when I say smoking hot, I'm talking more about his looks than his drum playing ability, because apparently that's the reason why they hired him. It wasn't so much he was a good drummer. He was just a good looking dude. And apparently all the other guys thought that they needed a hot guy to kind of bring the ladies in. So uh, so they got hey, him. Much like, our, much like our podcast needs you as our sex symbol, Matt. You know, that's right. That's right. Ones, so. that's yep. right. I, I have a face made for podcasts. So, um, and then, uh, and so, and the fifth member was, was, uh, later in that year, um, was blue, was actually a bluegrass mandolinist, Chris Hillman, um, who joined the band, uh, in, in latter part of 19, the fall of 1964 to, uh, to round out the core quintet of quintet of the band. Um, so this, they, you know, I looked up their influences. I think that's always an interesting thing to look at. And, uh, most notably, obviously the, the Beatles and Bob Dylan, um, were two of their biggest influences. So this was another reason why I really wanted to learn more about them and, and hear more about them. But they also cite, um, other artists like Jefferson Airplane and John Coltrane, who actually Roger McGuinn is actually, um, with their, with their single that came before this album, um, eight miles high. He modeled his guitar solo after a John John Coltrane sax solo. Um, so it's, if you hear it, it's really all over the place, and it's and you can kind of see that being played as like a frantic jazz, you know, saxophone solo, which I found interesting that he was, you know, drawing that influence there. Um, but other artists such as Pete Seeger, Graham Parsons, Buck Owens, Leuven Brothers, Rolling Stones, and the Beach Boys. So they were driving, you know, um, you know, getting getting uh, influences from really all over the place. Um, and by 1964, you know, McGuinn was really into the Beatles and um, really and, and they made their signature sound really trying to blend the Beatles pop with Dylan's folk. Um, and actually, they covered Dylan a ridiculous amount of times just on their first album. I think they have four covers of Dylan songs. Um, and so going back to what we were talking about last week, you know, you could make the argument that they did Dylan better than Dylan did, you know, with their hits, Tambourine, hit, you know, Mr. Tambourine Man um, was a huge hit, uh, you know, and that's probably, you know, that might be a more well-known song. Their version might be more well-known than Dylan's version. Um, but uh, but over the years, you know, they, they incorporated those styles with elements of country music. Um, they had really good harmonies. They were, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good harmonies in their albums. Um, and then Roger McGuinn was famous for, you know, the, one of the famous sounds in the band is, is the jangly sounding 12 string Rick, Rickenbacker guitar, um, which really highlighted and defined their sound of the time. Uh, so the band, uh, they, they signed a recording contract with Columbia on November 10th, 1964. And two years later, they decided to act, or I'm sorry, two weeks later, they decided to change their name to the birds. Um, I found a couple of reasons for this. Um, one was that it was an homage to the Beatles um, to, to kind of come up with a word and that is intentionally spelled wrong. Um, but it also, it still has the, uh, you know, the, the theme of flight in, in their name from their first band jet set. Now they're the birds, but then there was another report that said that this was a, uh, this was a name chosen in homage to somebody named Admiral Richard bird, who was famous for ex uh, leading expeditions to the North and South poles. Um, I don't know. That's all I heard about that. I don't know why that would have any influence. I don't know why that was interesting to them but there you go um so prior to this they released three albums from 1965 to 1966 and um really found themselves earning a lot of uh, mass popularity with two number one hits um both covers uh the first one was turn 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 to everything there is a season which was uh which was originally um, a song by pete Seeger, um and then mr tambourine man 
um, Eight Miles High came out just before this album, um, and that that peaked at number fourteen. Uh, there are some thoughts that that really should have gone higher in the charts, but um, many radio stations talking about banning. There was a lot of uh, banning going on in the sixties, but some of the radio stations felt that this was too much of a reference to recreational drug use, which of course the band denied. Um, Cause I'm sure none of them were doing drugs, particularly David Crosby. If you were talking um, about boning or drugs in the sixties, you always ran that yeah. risk, of, you know, just not being on the radio. So yep. yeah, as we saw so, with Janis um, Joplin. Yep. Yes. Yes. A major theme. So, so that's kind of a background of the band um, in general, but uh, in terms of your, I think we've all heard of them. Um, but in terms of knowledge of their songs or their, their catalogs, any, um, any thoughts on that? Uh, John, we'll start with you. Uh, I, I, the very first thing I'd say is I was going to make the joke as you were doing it, but I didn't want to cut in. I feel like those early bird songs, if you watch any sort of song, especially about being a youth in the sixties, you're going to hear those, you know, for everything, turn, turn and Mr. Tambourine, man, those songs just come up constantly. Um, in the same way that CCR does in, you know, (laughs) war documentaries or protest documentaries, I feel the birds fill a niche for that. But, uh, I'm pretty familiar with the birds. Um, I also know that their their album, change, their uh, excuse me, their lineup changes like the wind. So it depends on which lineup is playing, which birds you're gonna get. So um, I'll go into that a little bit later, but uh, I'll throw it over to Josh to give his uh, his background on the band. Oh, I really only know the birds from from those two hits. Um, I don't think I've ever listened to any of their albums. Growing up listening to oldies, those hits were always on the radio play. So. Um, the first time I heard this album, listening to it, just for, I was like, what is this hippie shit? And then, <laughs> and then the more I listen to it, the more I like it. So I don't know what that says, but, um, well, it was, it was, then, go go ahead, ahead, no, I was, no, I was going to continue, but Josh seemed like he was, he still had more to say. I was going to say, I really, the harmonies really stood out to me on this album. Yeah. Um, that's apparent in like every song in. I guess that's probably a signature sound for them um, or Mm -hmm. signature note. Um, And I really, I really like that. But then you get weird stuff like that CTA 102 song with aliens in it. And I'm like, what is this? (laughs) What drugs are they on? So I'll I'll tell you, I I love this album. And because I love Jangle Pop, love, love, love Jangle Pop. And you can draw a straight line between Mm -hmm. what the birds were doing and what Peter Buck was doing with R.E.M. in the 80s, one of my all time favorite bands, not to mention Johnny Marr. And I know both of those guitarists, Edward Smiths and both of those guitarists were highly influenced by the birds. Um, so I know the birds both by reputation and by, I don't think you can be familiar with jangle pop as a subgenre and not immediately draw a straight line back to the birds because they yeah. are clearly the four, the forerunners of that sound of guitar, which is one that very much appeals to me. So um, this album was right in my wheelhouse in terms of mm. what it sounded like. Yeah, and the band was really like a, um, it was kind of like America's version, uh, you know, uh, it was America's uh, British Invasion band. You know, they were right, they were right in the in line with that time period with bands like the Kinks, like the Beatles. Um, and, you know, they achieved both mass, you know, uh, uh, success through, um, you know, commercially and, and, and then, our, and then uh, critically as well. So um, this album is kind of interesting because it marks, it, it, there's a lot of interesting facts behind what was going on with the band. John talked about, you know, a variety of different, um, you know, uh, lineups that, that, that uh, were involved with, with the birds. But, um, but basically this, the album was, was recorded in, in Hollywood, California over 11 days um, from November 28th through December 6th in 1966. Um, the original title was Sanctuary. Uh, But apparently that was scrapped for the Dylan inspired um, uh, song, My Back Pages, which is the Dylan cover that's on this on this album. And so the younger than yesterday is in reference to to um, to that song. Um, There was absolutely sounds like a Dylan uh, album title compared to Sanctuary. I'd like to point out. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know why. What what were Sanctuary? I didn't see what the reason, the meaning behind that was. But uh, but yeah, this this is probably sounding a little bit better, I think. Um, There were three main singles off of it. Um, The title, the uh, the opening track, I should say, So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star, which was actually released um, about a month prior to the release of the album. And then, of course, Dylan's My Back Pages, the cover of Dylan's My Back Pages. And then um, Have You Seen Her Face? 
I peaked at number 24 in the Billboard Top 137 on the UK charts, um, and it was seen as actually a drop off um, from their their more commercially successful albums, particularly uh, their first album, Mr. Tambourine Man, and then their second album, Turn, Turn, Turn. Um, so they started to lose a little bit of that popularity. Um, the singles that came off of this album were not as popular as the ones that came off their previous um, albums. Uh, but that actually also opened the doors for them to get some uh, critical acclaim from um, from other followers, more in the underground, uh, you know, uh, music scene who really disdained music singles or, or hit singles. And they, you know, more likely to regard albums as as, you know, major artistic, you know. Uh, statements or uh, works of art or whatever. So, um, so they kind of started to branch out their fan base um, through this album. But most notably, the, one of the main things that happened was that the, the principal songwriter, Gene Clark, um, actually left the band in early 1966. So this is the first album, um, the first complete Birds album that doesn't involve any songwriter from, songwriting from Gene Clark, who was the, the principal songwriter. Um, he did have, it, it, even though he left before the release of their previous album, Fifth Dimension, um, he did contribute to um, Eight Miles High. So, um, so there is some contribution to that album by him. But I found his reasons for quitting the band kind of interesting. Um, you know, apparently man, the management company or the people involved behind the scenes, you know, really wanted McGuinn to take on the lead vocals for um, the major singles and for the Dylan cover. So, you know, Gene Clark was a little upset by that. He also ironically had a fear of flying, um, even though he was in the birds and, uh, you know, really didn't like traveling. And um, apparently there was some resentment from other band members um, because he was making more money because he was the main songwriter. And I, always, I got a chuckle out of this. Um, apparently working with the notoriously arrogant David Crosby reportedly nearly drove him to a nervous breakdown. Um, so I think I was that going that's around the thing. 60s, this nervous breakdown. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's also going around with anybody who actually worked with David Crosby, because even today he still is pissed off all the members of Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, except himself. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah. So. Um, so the, the I, other thing that's most go ahead. Yeah. Jump in. I was going to say, could I, I would have just add one thing. It's, it's clear when you listen to this album that there's multiple songwriters, because yes. I feel like the songs besides even just the singing of the songs, you this album is a compilation of multiple different really good songwriters and i think that was a when they talk about compared to earlier albums i actually think that was a definitive strength of this album even compared to some of their earlier work it's that you even if you only liked one of the three songwriters you were going to get songs that were basically hits coming out of that songwriter and and when you yeah. enjoy multiple songwriters from the group like i do you get a very complex album but it's not repetitive or boring because you're getting all these different angles yeah. And, and that's and most notably, the, 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 the songwriter that really stood out here was Chris Hillman, the bass player, who um, has four songs that were totally written by him on his own. And then he also contributed to So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. And so prior to that, he didn't really have any writing contributions at all. So this this album is really well known for him being able to stand out um, and write four songs, um, two of which actually really go into the country direction, which the band really, really took on. Um, in subsequent years, particularly in 1968 with Sweetheart Over the Rodeo, which I was I was I was upset to learn that that, that I think that clocks in at number 104 on the list of top 100 albums of the 60s, which I was really wanting to talk about that album because it's got, you know, Graham Parsons in it. And it's just a really it's it's really dubbed the first country rock album. You know, it's really where that's where that started, or at least a lot of people recognize that as being the catalyst for a lot of country rock albums that came came later on. Um, but yeah, but there are two songs highlighted that were really in the country realm um, that were both written by Hillman. And um, but in addition to that, he also wrote a wrote like a pretty much straight ahead rock song, which was Have You Seen Her Face, which is one of the singles. And then he kind of goes into more of the psychedelic realm with thoughts and words. Um, and you hear that in, in the album. There's several psychedelic songs, um, mostly written by Crosby and McGuinn, including the god awful Mind Gardens, which is just yes. a meandering, meandering, <laughs> self indulgent. Boring, a, no melody, unlistenable. On an album of, of eight oh. nines and nine point fives, it was a two for me in terms of it, which stands out because everything else was so strong. So I can't agree enough. And it comes at a spot where it's just 
it, it's so unwelcome because there's so much good. And then it's, yes. it's followed by the Dylan cover, if I remember correctly, which is it's such a palate cleanser at that point. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. just like, thank God. Yes. For I agree. To, yes. But I tried, I tried to like it and I tried to like, maybe I'm missing something, you know? And then I just realized what well, the first time I heard it, I was, I was just had it in my headphones and I was like, what is this? And then I looked down, I'm like, what's this called? And of course, I'm like, mind gardens. And it's just, it's, it's just as pompous and it's, it's just horrible. It's not a good yeah. song. And pretty much everybody in the band hated it. Not that everybody in the band that wasn't named David Crosby hated it. Yeah. Um, and he defended it. So just, I have my own issues with Crosby. He's such a cantankerous, like he's the guy that sits back and says, you know, people today, like Kanye West has no talent. Um, yet he said he defends a song like this. So, um, but, but yeah, but Crosby, he wasn't, a, there is, this is really where the contention starts. So we're going to see this. We're going to do one more birds album um, a, a later on. Um, it's the only other one that's here, but, uh, but he was starting to really have fights with the band. Um, he did not want my back pages on this album. He thought that it wasn't a step forward. It was too much hanging in the past. Um, you know, the rest of the band didn't like Mind Gardens. He really, and then he pushed for the closing track Y to be on the album, even though that out, that song was actually a B side to, um, eight miles high. It was, it was a different version, but the song was actually released already. And the speculation is he wanted that to be on the album to increase his writing credits. Um, which well, he wasn't wrong, probably that's a darn true. good song. That's a damn good it's, song though. So it, it's, I'd argue that yes. he made the right call on that one. It is a good song, but I also think that that's, that's it, it. I'm totally, I totally believe that that's the reason why he wanted it, you know, on there more so than it was a, a you know, a good song. Um, so, uh, and then finally, uh, the other thing that's notable here is they, they started working with a new producer named Gary Usher, who was actually a songwriting partner with Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. Um, and this guy had a wealth of production experience and a love of innovative sound exper studio experimentation. So you can really hear that on a lot of songs on this album. Um, you know, it blends pop, rock, folk, country, uh, includes se several psychedelic songs. Um, the bass lines that Chris Hillman's playing is really, you know, modeled after McCartney melodic bass lines. Um, and overall, you know, even though it wasn't as uh, popular when it was released, as the years have gone on, it's really seen uh, as a major step forward for the band. Um, and it's, it's, it's grown in acclaim over time. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's basically the, the overall history of it. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I did like the variety here. I've liked it the more I've listened to it. Um, you know, but, uh, Josh, did you find yourself liking it more? Or are you still feeling it? It's like the hippie, the, the hippie BS. No, I, I liked it the more I listened to it. Um, you get that Indian music instrumentation in there again. Um, Raga. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I really like that, that, I guess it would be a tempo change in thoughts and words into the chorus. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes slow and then speeds up. I really like that. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good songs on this album. Um, I, I don't like the alien uh, CTA song. I think that's stupid, but <laughs> that's interesting because he had McGuinn had like a, he was really interested in that. That's named after a quasar, which I don't oh. even know what a quasar is. But uh, but apparently he what he he was really interested in the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the alien. And it sounds for those that don't know the song at the end, it sounds like a bunch of aliens are having a conversation. But what they did really was um, they just talked. They just recorded themselves talking, not really saying much of anything. And they sped it up really, really quickly to get that high. It's the same thing um, David Lynch sound. did in Twin Peaks in the Black Lodge. In oh, is that what it was? For okay. those that are familiar. Yeah. As I was listening to it, I was laughing. I said, well, they've clearly been uh, influential on David. Well, maybe not specifically, but it's the same concept. Yeah. Well, the funny thing was, is Roger McGuinn was like, yeah, he goes, we, we just did it because we knew a lot of people were like, you know, trying to play records backwards and to hear the message behind things. And there was no message behind this. We just wanted to mess with people and have them, you know, rewind, you know, rewind, you know, play it backwards. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's kind of the story behind that. But Josh, at least that's only like a two minute long song. If that it's, it's over pretty quick, which a lot of the songs on this album are pretty quick. That's another reason why I like it. It's like, you know, within 32 minutes, the album's pretty much over, um, which um, I think I like, I'm appreciating more is like, is brevity, brevity in an album, you know, not going too long and going, um, you know, more, you know, taking more time than it really needs to. Um, so, so well, yeah. My, um, my biggest argument with a lot of 60s stuff sometimes, and, and especially we'll see in the 70s, is that it can be self-indulgent at times. And that was one thing I appreciate. Nothing to overstate its welcome. I would say, yeah, Mind Garden was terrible. But outside of that, I, there, I don't think there was another song. that I, I even liked CTA 102. I, I don't have the same hangups that, that uh, 
that Matt has with David Crosby. Um, I wouldn't have him <laughs> be my, my child sperm donor, but at the same Sounds time, like you haven't uh, met David Crosby. Yes, but hey, you know what? I, hey, there's, there's a long, long line of folks who are not people that you want to share a meal with, but who make damn good music. And Well, hey, I, and, for, and for those... For for those of you who uh, who are okay with David Crosby, you can you can you can find him writing advice columns in Rolling Stone nowadays. Uh, so apparently, if for those and I never get that if you if your life is so bad that you got to ask David Crosby for advice, you know, <laughs> I don't know. You might want to reconsider some things, but uh, yeah, somehow he's found himself into a, a Dear Abby role nowadays. But that's, that's, that's well, you know, when you're thinking about you know a lot of the boomers who are, who are. Uh, reading Rolling Stone, perhaps David Crosby does represent a cross section of them. But, yeah. but getting back to it real quick, I do want to say it is my favorite album we've had so far. I think it's excellent. If you like Jangle wow. Pop, it's an easy, easy yes. If you like albums that, that that are varied and come at you from different points, I think it's excellent. And, and even if you like, say, The Beatles, you know, I, I different parts said, you know, Time Between sounds like Act Naturally. Thoughts and Words sounds like Baby You Can Drive My Car at points. So if you have a a love for that type of Beatles, um, you're going to find elements that tie it together as well. So strong recommendation for me. Josh? Yeah, I, I like this album. I recommend it. Uh, definitely check it out. Yeah. And I, I would ag- I would agree. And I, I think my, my disdain of David Crosby is just the stories that I hear about him more so than his songwriting cause, and his musicianship because I do like a lot of his stuff. Says the guy uh, who likes Guns N' Roses. Yeah. <laughs> Gotcha. I All do right. love Guns N' Roses, but they, I find them funny. Dad will find David Crosby funny. I just find him to be a cantankerous old man. But uh, that's true. Yeah, I do like Guns N' Roses. Um, but I do like, I will give Crosby, I, I really did like um, Everybody's Been Burned. I think that that was a song that when I first heard, I was kind of okay on. And as, as, as I let that sink in and played it several times, I thought that, that was a really, really strong song that I, that ends up being one of my favorites on the albums, but on the album. Um, but I do, I liked, I love the Chris Hillman contributions, particularly the country uh, songs time between and the girl with no name. I think that those are really, really good songs and just impressive for a dude that really didn't shot, that really didn't have any songwriting credits on any previous album. And, and then he comes through with those. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's great. I'm excited to listen to, they only have one other album on this list. Um, it's the one that comes after this. Um, so I am going to, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to save an observation for that one. But one thing that I'm going to mention the next time is that Dylan birds crossover. You can really see how the birds, instead of the harmonica, like Dylan does, they really use guitar to fill in spaces. And that's going to be something in the next album that is even more prominent. So that's just one thing I just want to sort of throw out there that, if you like Dylan, but you like guitar and your harmonica fills, the birds might be right up your alley. Absolutely. It's good stuff. 